It's hard to believe the Nintendo 3DS is over 10 years old now. It feels like just yesterday I was scrounging through forums looking for new information and getting on YouTube to find any new footage I could. I had never been so excited for a system before, other than maybe the Wii, and when I finally picked mine up on launch day, me and my questionable haircut were ecstatic. You see, I had always been a huge fan of dedicated portable systems ever since I was a kid. The Game Boy Color was the first system I ever owned. I played more Game Boy Advance games on my GameCube than I did actual GameCube games. The DS had an insane library of quirky, unique games I adored. And with the 3DS, it looked like Nintendo would continue that handheld dominance once again, but this time with glasses-free 3D. Yeah, the initial showings of the 3DS during E3 had people buzzing. Everyone was talking about how cool this new tech was, and I was eating it all up. I was hyped, to say the least, and it seemed like others were too, but maybe not hyped enough to drop 250 bones on the thing. At the time, $250 for a handheld console, especially from Nintendo, seemed like a huge ask, and this showed in the sales numbers. Less than six months after the launch of the system, Nintendo dropped the price of the 3DS by $80, which seemed insane, but it worked. The price drop, along with the impending one-two punch of Super Mario 3D Land and Mario Kart 7, got people excited again with the system finally starting to hit its stride. And the games just kept on coming. So many fantastic releases showed up over the coming years, and there was a little something for everyone, both at retail and on the eShop where you could find a ton of unique digital-only content. I think at this point, most people have a good idea of what's on offer in the 3DS's library when it comes to domestic releases, but what about the games that were only released in Japan? As always, there's plenty to explore, and that's what I want to talk about today. Now, I obviously won't be able to check out all of the Japanese exclusives in this video, but I did want to mention some of the ones that seemed interesting to me. You may be wondering how you'll need to go about playing said imports, though. The 3DS was region locked after all, a first for a Nintendo handheld system. Well, you could go the route of buying a Japanese system off of eBay or something, but if, if you didn't know, it's actually really easy to mod your 3DS. Anyone can do it. <clears throat> And with a modded 3DS, along with making your system region-free, you can also utilize the fan translations that are available for some of the games I'll be talking about. I'm not going to link to any instructions here on how to do that, but y'all are smart. I'm sure you can find it with a quick internet search. With all that out of the way though, let's get to the first game. Or, I guess, series of games. Have you heard of Dragon Quest? Ah yes, Dragon Quest. It seems like nowadays, Dragon Quest is a huge franchise for Square Enix, not only in Japan, but across the pond as well. We get pretty much every release, including spin-offs like Dragon Quest Builders and Dragon Quest Treasures. It wasn't always like this, though. In the past, Square seemed much more hesitant to bring the series out west. We didn't get Dragon Quest V or VI in English until the DS remakes, and who knows if we would have even gotten Dragon Quest IX without Nintendo stepping in to publish it over here. That hesitancy didn't change much with the 3DS either. Of the nine Dragon Quest and Dragon Quest adjacent games released on the 3DS, only the remakes of Dragon Quest 7 VII and 8 were localized, and both of those were published by Nintendo as well. So what did we miss out on? Well, Japan got a 3DS version of Dragon Quest XI to go along with the console version, and the 3DS version at the time was arguably the most interesting way to play that game. It was built from the ground up for the handheld, and you could choose between a full 3D polygonal mode or a more classic 2D option. This 2D mode was later added to the Switch version of Dragon Quest XI, but the lower poly 3D mode is still only playable on 3DS. Other than that, there were quite a few Dragon Quest Monsters games released for the system as well. There's Dragon Quest Monsters Joker 3 and its updated release of Dragon Quest Monsters Joker 3 Professional, and then there are the remakes of Dragon Quest Monsters and Dragon Quest Monsters 2. Yes, Square fully remade the Game Boy versions of Dragon Quest Monsters and Monsters 2 on the 3DS, and we never got them. These Monsters games have that Dragon Quest DNA, but share some things in common with Pokemon too, as you can recruit monsters and add them to your team. They all play pretty similarly, but they're a fun time. Now, those games are cool and everything, but there are two Dragon Quest games I wanted to dig into a little bit more. 
2 games I really wish we got over here in the West. Let's start off though with Slime Morimori Dragon Quest 3, or as I'll be referring to it, Dragon Quest Heroes Rocket Slime 3. Yeah, that name might sound familiar to some of you. That's because we actually got a game over here called Dragon Quest Heroes Rocket Slime on the OG DS. Okay, so where is Rocket Slime 2 then? The game we got as Dragon Quest Heroes Rocket Slime is actually Slime Morimori Dragon Quest 2. The first game in the series was released on the Game Boy Advance, and that too never got localized. I don't know why Square does this. Unlike the mainline Dragon Quest titles and many of the other spin-offs, which are very standard JRPGs, the Rocket Slime series plays a lot more like a traditional top-down action-adventure game in the vein of Zelda or something similar. The first two Rocket Slime games always felt like a breath of fresh air in the Dragon Quest franchise, and both were fantastic experiences with beautiful pixel art, fun gameplay, and a great sense of humor. Rocket Slime 3 is really no different. As the title might suggest, you play as a slime here, and you've got to save the world from the evil platywags who have stolen the sacred rainbow orbs which are said to have the power to give life to anything. You know, given their history, I wouldn't expect a slime to be much of a match for, well, anything really, but we are no ordinary slime. We have the power to stretch and, uh, float, I guess. Nothing else we need, to be honest. Simplicity is the name of the game here, and there's nothing wrong with that. Playing Rocket Slime 3 feels great, and it's always satisfying using your Elastoblast attack. You'll adventure around different islands to find the rainbow orbs, and on the way, you'll talk to a bunch of other slimes, collect items, and roam through dungeons. The bosses at the end of these dungeons, while fairly easy, are always a spectacle. They really made great use of the 3D effects. And while we're on that point, I gotta say, I am such a big fan of the way this game looks. I've always liked the whole 2D sprites on a 3D polygonal world aesthetic. It may not have that same crisp look as the fully 2D games that came before it, but it's something different and I love it. There is one other aspect of Rocket Slime that sets it apart from other similar adventure games. You see, to get to different islands and areas, you'll have to roam the seas on your trusty ship. The waters are not always friendly though. There comes a time in every slime's life where they'll have to engage in ocean warfare and these fights are frantic, fast, fraught with danger, and most importantly, fun. You'll have to run around the deck shooting items at the enemy and countering their attacks until one of you does enough damage, at which point you get to invade the foe's ship and take it down once and for all. As you play the game, you'll be able to customize and upgrade your ship more and more with some wild designs. It's really fun and helps change the pace up from the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Rocket Slime 3 and the previous two games in the series are a blast, and I highly recommend checking them out even if you don't care about the Dragon Quest games. Oh, by the way, you've probably noticed by now that many of the games here have been in English, too. Yeah, almost every Dragon Quest game on the 3DS has gotten a fan translation. A game like Rocket Slime 3 definitely wouldn't be as enjoyable without being able to read the witty dialogue, so huge thanks to the translators out there. That other Dragon Quest game I mentioned though? Yeah, it doesn't have a translation, but it doesn't really need one. Let's groove with Theater Rhythm Dragon Quest. Of all the Dragon Quest games that got left in Japan, for some reason, Theater Rhythm is the most surprising to me. There would be minimal translation effort, we already got two versions of Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy on the same system, and I mean, anyone can appreciate the music of Dragon Quest even if they aren't a fan of the games. I just don't get it. Hell, even now that Dragon Quest is a much bigger franchise in the West, we still haven't seen a port on consoles, despite getting Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory and another version of Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy. At least this 3DS version is easy to find, and as I mentioned, there's not much of a language barrier here since we're talking about a rhythm game. And what a game it is. If you haven't played Theater Rhythm before, well, then you should if you have any interest in rhythm titles at all. You'll tap, hold, and swipe to the tune of 60 songs spanning the entire Dragon Quest series. At least, for the main series up until Dragon Quest X. There are some minor RPG elements like party building and leveling up, but I never pay too much attention to that here. And 
I never did in the Final Fantasy iterations of this series either. Having a higher level party does help by allowing you to miss more often, but it's not something I would say is necessary. If you've played Theater Rhythm Final Fantasy, everything here will be familiar. Just like those games, there are three types of music sequences. Battle, Field, and Event. Battle sequences will see you fighting against different foes and the music usually consists of battle themes from the games. Field sequences are more akin to roaming the environment and are the only sequences where you'll have to move your stylus up or down to follow some of the notes. And finally, the event sequences are songs which include accompanying video in the background like cutscenes or gameplay. It's all a ton of fun and the music in Dragon Quest is legendary so you can't go wrong with the tracklist. As you play, you'll unlock new characters, trading cards, and more. There are a few extra game modes too, like this weird board game thing, but really, all of them just have you playing the main game, which is fine by me. I'm just a huge fan of it all. One area that may be polarizing are the chibi character and monster designs, but I've always loved those and I think it fits the aesthetic of these games perfectly. Add this one to your import list for sure. Phew. Man, that was a lot of Dragon Quest. Let's move on to something a little different now. If you were following the 3DS early on in its life, this game may have been on your radar. Sadly, we obviously never got it. This is Time Travelers from Level 5. Man, Level 5. I could honestly do a whole video about them. They've made some of my favorite games and favorite series of all time, and now? They basically have zero presence outside of Japan since they've shut down their North American operations as of 2020. It's crazy and kind of sad to think about given some of the huge hits they've had like Yokai Watch and Professor Layton. Time Travelers, on the other hand, wasn't one of those big sellers. It was released during this weird time for Level 5 where they were pumping out game after game in Japan. It was caught smack dab in between things like their wildly popular soccer RPG Inazuma 11 and the upcoming Professor Layton vs Ace Attorney, as well as the highly anticipated fantasy life. Level 5 didn't ignore Time Travelers though. I remember seeing a lot of coverage of the game from Nintendo sites and they included a demo in the very interesting compilation of Guild Zero One which some of you may have played games from. The problem was, that game in and of itself was pretty niche, so I can't imagine a ton of people were exposed to it. But what is Time Travelers exactly? I think a pretty easy way to describe it is that it's a narrative-focused adventure with choices the player needs to make as well as some quick time events to keep you engaged. The game was written and directed by Jiro Ishii who had previously worked on games like 9 Hours, 9 Persons, 9 Doors, and 428 Shibuya Scramble, the latter of which famously got a perfect score from Famitsu Magazine when it originally released on the Wii. So obviously, there's some pedigree there. The story begins inside of the Cylinder Lab where a test experiment involving, well, time traveling has seemingly gone very wrong. With the emergency shutdown operations not working, the scientists are unable to prevent disaster. A strange hole which would come to be known as the Lost Hole appears out of nowhere and causes a huge explosion, destroying the surrounding Tokyo area. It's an exciting and eventful opening which creates intrigue and leads into the main part of the game taking place 18 years after the incident seen in the intro in a newly rebuilt Tokyo. You'll play as five different characters throughout the adventure with their own stories and scenarios, but as you keep playing, these stories and characters will intertwine. As mentioned before, you'll also be making lots of choices which can affect the outcome of things. There's usually a good choice and a bad choice, but if you do ever make a bad choice, you can always rewind time and change it. I've often loved a good plot involving time travel, being a fan of movies like Looper, 12 Monkeys, and of course Back to the Future, so the story surrounding Time Travelers was right up my alley. Unfortunately, there is no fan translation like with a lot of the Dragon Quest games, but there is an English playthrough here on YouTube from the user Zakobot, which is fantastic. If any of this sounds appealing to you, I highly recommend checking them out. That's what I did, and I was absorbed the entire way through, and with the minimal interactivity, you're not missing out too much by not being in full control. It's a shame Time Travelers was never localized, but I'm happy we still have a way to experience it. Okay, I think it's time for a quick lightning round now. There are just so many things I want to talk about and not enough time, so let's take a look at a few games back to back. Starting off with the one and only Maple Story.
You may know MapleStory as the massively successful free-to-play MMO on PC, but I doubt most of you knew about the standalone single-player adaptation released on the 3DS. MapleStory, The Girl of Destiny. Okay, I, I should mention I'm cheating a bit here. The Girl of Destiny isn't technically a Japanese exclusive. It was also released in South Korea, which makes sense given the franchise was originally developed there. Now, I know next to nothing about MapleStory, so I can't tell you much about how this compares with the online PC version. What I can talk about is my experience playing this 3DS version, and honestly, I was pleasantly surprised. The Girl of Destiny isn't a very deep game. It's got simple combat, basic RPG mechanics, and pretty standard level design, but it has a ton of charm oozing through with the characters and visuals. I absolutely fell in love with these little pirate guys early on and wanted to see what new foes and areas were coming next. The pixel art here also really shines with beautiful animations and environmental design. You'll go around fighting a bunch of enemies, picking up new items which all change your appearance, and doing some side missions throughout the different towns you end up in. The bosses are also a lot of fun and the developers did some cool things playing around with the perspective during some of the fights. Like I said, there's nothing complex here with MapleStory The Girl of Destiny, but what's there is a good time and with a fan translation available, it's an easy game to recommend. MapleStory is a blast from the past, but now it's time to go even further back with Game Center CX3. Kind of. At least, it's trying to emulate a more retro experience. Game Center CX3 is the third game in the series we know in North America as Retro Game Challenge. And yeah, we only ever got the first Retro Game Challenge on the original DS. These games were based off of a TV show in Japan also called Game Center CX where a man by the name of Shinya Arino would try to challenge himself with some old school classics. Much like the show, the games are similar in that there are a bunch of newly created retro video games with challenges you'll need to complete. What made the original so special though to me were the little things like getting new magazines each month that gave you tips and tricks for how to beat certain challenges in games, the full game manuals, or the references to classic video game culture. It was super well done. Game Center CX3 is a lot of the same, but without any translation patch, it's hard to really grasp that same enjoyment without Japanese language knowledge. The games within CX3 are still decently fun, and it still feels great whenever you unlock a new one, but something just doesn't feel right here. Maybe some of it has to do with the new art style, which I feel is a big step back from the originals on the DS, or maybe that language barrier is just too much. But I also wasn't able to find any of those things that pushed Retro Game Challenge above and beyond. No manuals, no magazines, none of that. It's a real shame. They did add these new, like, arcade-style coin games or rock-paper-scissors, but those are really just simple distractions that don't add much to the experience. Even if you're a fan of the original Retro Game Challenge, I'd say skip this one and instead give Retro Game Challenge 2 a shot. That game was also only released in Japan, but it has a fan translation, and in my opinion, it's even better than the original. A sequel that fares quite a bit better, though, is Touch Detective 3. Oh, sorry, that's that's not the full title. Let's see here, um, uh, Touch Detective Rising 3, Does Fungi Dream of Bananas? Maybe I shouldn't be surprised by that title given that they called the second game in the series Touch Detective 2.5 for some reason. Either way, Touch Detective is a very quirky, very fun point-and-click style adventure series with some extremely witty writing. You come to these games for the story and the laughs, and Touch Detective 3 delivers on those fronts. It's fun to use your mind as well to solve puzzles and uncover the mysteries going on within the world, but like I mentioned, the star of the show is the writing and all of the characters you interact with along the way. Hell, the entire plot of the first episode of Touch Detective 3 revolves around finding someone's stolen bananas. Wait, the title makes a lot more sense now. Damn. Even with such a simple premise in the first episode, things take some wild turns and you'll soon find out there's a lot more going on here. 
With a great presentation to back up everything else, you probably already know if this type of game is for you. Thankfully, there's also a fantastic fan translation, and if you haven't played a Touch Detective game before, don't worry, you don't have to play the older games in the series to enjoy this one. But I'd still check those out too if you can. A compilation of all the games was released on the Switch, but sadly, that's stuck in Japan too. Hopefully, it'll get localized one day. Want something even cuter than a detective game about bananas and mushrooms? Look no further than Sumiko Gurashi and Mamegoma from the Japanese company San X. Sumiko Gurashi consists of quite a few different characters based on different animals and foods. They're all unbelievably cute and have their own little backstories. My favorites are Tokage, which is the last dinosaur alive pretending to be a lizard, and Penguin? Yes. Penguin has a question mark in their name. A green penguin who used to wear a plate on their head does sound kind of fishy though. Or should I say, turtley. To go along with that, Mamegoma consists of a bunch of different seal characters that come in all different colors. Much like Sumiko Gurashi characters, the Mamegoma seals are stupid cute and I could cry just looking at them. Getting to their games though, both franchises have multiple titles on the 3DS, but I played Sumiko Garashi Here You Settle Down and Mamegoma Yoiko Maruko Genkinako. Both games have their similarities in that they're kind of like pet simulators. Think something like Nintendogs or the Chow Garden in Sonic Adventure 2 where you can raise these characters, play minigames, buy new toys, food and outfits for them, and just hang out. They're super chill experiences that are adorable, and while they may not have much depth, I love them just for the characters alone. Unfortunately, they may not be the easiest to play as Mamegoma doesn't have a translation patch, and the one that is available for Sumiko Gurashi is a little, well, jank. That's okay though, because it gets the job done. Moving on now, let's talk about Capcom. Capcom was a huge supporter of the 3DS and single-handedly brought in millions of system sales with Monster Hunter, but even they left some games in Japan. And EX Troopers was one of those. EX Troopers. Anyone at a quick glance can tell this game hails straight from Japan with its aesthetic, but what's not so obvious is that it's actually a spin-off of another Capcom series known as Lost Planet. Lost Planet has a completely different look to it, and other than some of the enemies looking similar, I would have been hard pressed to tell you these two games were part of the same universe, even if you showed them to me side by side. The mainline Lost Planet series is cool and all, but I think what EX Troopers is going for is a bit more my speed. In Troopers, you play as Bren Turner, a new VS pilot recruit looking to make his way up the ranks at the Academy on the planet EDN3. On the way to EDN3, your transport ship comes under surprise attack, and you're tasked with taking them out by your instructor, Walter, even though Bren has zero experience piloting to this point. After taking out all the enemies, you're unexpectedly caught in the planet's gravitational pull and are free-falling into its atmosphere. From there, you crash land in your escape pod and make your way back to the academy after being saved from a giant creature. The academy essentially works as your hub area, and here, you'll be able to interact with others, buy or upgrade items, and of course, take on missions. Gameplay in EX Troopers is separated into many different missions and almost has a similar feel to Monster Hunter as you'll make your way through missions eventually fighting a boss. Of course, coming from Capcom, this similarity isn't a huge surprise, especially given the popularity of Monster Hunter. Unlike Monster Hunter though, you'll be running and gunning here with very simple to learn third person shooter combat. Each weapon has a primary fire and a secondary fire, and you'll also have a special EX attack that you can use when charged up. All of your weapons can be customized, and you'll unlock plenty of new ones throughout the course of the game. You've also got different partners that will join you as you progress, and eventually you'll be able to choose which partner to bring with you. They all have their own unique weapons, so it's up to the player to decide who makes sense for what mission. From what I've played, I've had a lot of fun making my way through all the different missions there are to play, but I can see how this strict mission-based structure could be off-putting for some. If you're into that sort of thing though, I think you'll have a lot of fun with EX Troopers. I can't go without mentioning the presentation a little more too. This game is one of the very weird, rare instances where it was released on both the 3DS and the PS3? Actually, it might be the only game that has that distinction. With that being said, the 3DS version of EX Troopers looks absolutely amazing for a handheld title of the time. 
Obviously, the PS3 version looks fantastic and much better than the 3DS, but if you wanted to play on the go, I don't think you'd be complaining about the visuals. Capcom knew how to get all they could out of that little handheld, as evidenced by something like Resident Evil Revelations. Truly great stuff. On the completely opposite end of the spectrum, though, is a game from Capcom that doesn't go for technical brilliance. At least, not in the visual department. Let me introduce you to Nozowaku Yakata. Roughly translating to the mansion of confusing puzzles, this title is something unlike any other on the 3DS. It was marketed as a sound adventure game because it uses 3D positional stereo audio to add tension and atmosphere to what is already a very weird and creepy experience. To go along with that, Yakata uses pretty much every feature of the 3DS to its fullest, from the microphone, to the camera, to the touchscreen, and even gyro controls. It almost feels like a tech demo for the system, and given that it was released just the few months after the 3DS came out in Japan, it wouldn't be a bad game to show off to friends thinking about picking up the new handheld. But what's inside this strange mansion? The various rooms that you explore here are filled with a number of different bizarre scenarios that you'd never see coming. It seems like each chapter is separated into different themes and right off the bat with the first chapter, we get a spooky horror theme that caught me completely off guard. I did not expect to be taking pictures of ghosts or trying to stop a demented mannequin. I also definitely didn't expect to see myself pop up in the game after cleaning up a mirror for this old creepy lady. This is the type of stuff Nazawaku Yakuta throws at you, and it's all just so wild. So here I was thinking this was going to be some crazy horror experience. And then I got to chapter 2, and the first thing I have to do is massage this scantily clad woman. Talk about whiplash. Like I said, I have no idea what to expect from this mysterious mansion, and to be honest, while I was playing, I was at a complete loss for words. Well, I would have been if there wasn't so much talking you have to do to play the game. Whenever this music note pops up on screen, you know it's time to say something, and although you can spout gibberish most of the way through, there are certain points where you do have to say something specific. And not being a Japanese speaker myself, that wasn't very easy to figure out. I was eventually able to progress in every section I played, but I can imagine getting stuck at some point. And that's honestly a real shame. Of all the games I've talked about so far, this is the one I'm most upset about never getting localized. It's the exact type of weird that I enjoy, but it's not even something that fan translators could make playable even if they wanted to, as almost all this adventure is voiced. I guess I'll have to continue to be oblivious as to what's going on in this mansion of wonders. Hey. Who knows? Maybe that's for the best. Okay, there's just one more game I want to talk about, and this one took me by surprise. Konami was still dishing out quite a few games back in the early 2010s, and one of their most ambitious ones on the 3DS seemed to be Beyond the Labyrinth. Beyond the Labyrinth is yet again another one of those games I remember seeing talked about on forums and Nintendo news sites all over the place with images prominently showing off this mysterious girl who I always thought would end up being the playable character. Visually, it looked stunning in early screenshots too, so it soon became one of my more anticipated titles early in the 3DS's life. It also definitely helped that the game was being developed by the very talented folks over at Tri-Ace, makers of the Star Ocean series, Valkyrie Profile, and Radiata Stories, among others. Pretty much every one of their releases up to that point had made their way overseas, so I was optimistic about Beyond the Labyrinth as well. But then, the months dragged on, and soon, it became apparent that Konami wasn't interested in bringing the game over stateside. Thanks to the incredible fan translators that are out there though, we can now see what this is all about. When you first boot up Beyond the Labyrinth, you're greeted with a very unexpected title screen. It looks almost retro in a way. But then you start a new game and wait, this looks nothing like what I saw in the early screenshots. Beyond the Labyrinth initially throws you for a loop as the game begins in a very classic looking online dungeon crawling adventure. You start off alone, but soon, random players will join your party and start chatting with you about video games and the like. You'll learn the basics of combat and fight a few enemies here and there, but as you make your way through the dungeon, you start hearing a voice. And eventually, you're transported somewhere completely unknown to you and your allies. This is where we first get to meet the girl that I had seen so many times in those early previews and screens. 
unlike what I thought back in the day, this nameless girl isn't playable at all. In fact, your party of online gamers sitting at home has been summoned to help save her and get her out of this deep valley back to the land above. And while the girl can seemingly see you and the players, she can't hear or read anything they're typing to each other, so communication isn't exactly easy. The girl's dialogue is completely voiced in Japanese with no subtitles, but you can usually gather what's being discussed based on how everyone replies through text messages. I even kind of liked the fact that I couldn't understand the girl as it made me feel more like I had been transported to a completely foreign world, even if the in-game players can understand her. The story here has an intriguing premise to say the least and had me wondering who the girl was and why we were the ones that were sent here to help. On the gameplay side of the spectrum, things play out very similarly to the old school tutorial area you started the game in. This is a true dungeon crawler at heart, and while you have a little more freedom of movement than some more classic dungeon crawlers, everything here is still essentially grid-based. And I guess now is probably the time to mention that I am not exactly a fan of dungeon crawlers. It's a gameplay style that just hasn't ever clicked with me. With that being said, something about Beyond the Labyrinth hooked me, and that something was the combat system. At first glance, combat almost feels like it has a rock-paper-scissors style system with each player and enemy being assigned a color. I like to think of it like a Pokemon game. Blue or water is stronger than red or fire, and red is stronger than green or grass. And then, obviously, green is stronger than blue. That's super easy to understand, but it's not as simple as just that. Each player and enemy also has a charge count which represents how powerful their attack will be. The higher the charge, the more damage will be dealt, but that comes at the cost of turn order. Your turn order is displayed on the touchscreen, and if you do a higher charged attack, the longer you'll have to wait to attack again in that battle. The other big mechanic here is the HP system and how healing works. There are no traditional healing items. While areas do sometimes have spots that can heal your party, most of the HP recovery will be done in combat itself. You see, when you or your enemy attack someone's weakness, that damage is tallied up and displayed in the top right corner of the screen with its corresponding color. The next person of that color to attack will absorb those hit points and regain health accordingly. So there's a careful balancing act of who you want to attack as you don't want to do a super effective hit on an enemy only to have it be the next one up to fight and absorb all that damage back up. Items you collect in each area can help you here too as they can affect turn order or allow you to change colors mid-battle. Okay, I realize that's probably a lot of information, so I thought it would be helpful to see it all play out in a battle from pretty early on in the game. To start off this fight, you can see there were some points already banked from previous encounters. I begin by attacking the heal keeper normally with my green party member and I absorb the green hit points. Next up in the turn order is my player, but I have full health so I'd rather not attack now and absorb the hit points available. Instead, I use an item to skip my turn and allow the other blue player to attack and absorb the HP since they were low on health. As I continue to deal damage, I realize I'm banking red HP which the enemy heal keeper will be able to absorb. Thankfully, I had an item that would absorb all of the HP for any party member. I should have used it on the blue character with low HP, but I wasn't paying attention. Again, when the time came, I skipped my character's turn so the enemy wouldn't have a chance to heal. And from there, I went ahead and destroyed the heal keeper as well as the large spirits that walked into the fight late. The combat mechanics are extremely deep and they get even deeper the more you play. You may have noticed the girl was part of the example encounter, but she was honestly kind of useless there. Later on, she'll learn magic abilities that allow her to attack, and a shield system also comes into play even later that just continues to add depth to the gameplay. I just love the strategy and forward thinking needed in each fight. While the combat is the star of the show, it's not the only thing great about Beyond the Labyrinth. The visuals are beautiful as you'll make your way through many different environment types, and the music has calming tracks while roaming around dungeons but can also accentuate the tension in battles with exciting melodies. The only thing that I can say I wasn't a fan of was the difficulty as well as the limited options when it comes to saving. I understand these are probably staples of dungeon crawlers, but it's one of the reasons why I wasn't a huge fan of them to begin with. I was playing on the easiest difficulty, which is normal, and I got my ass kicked in a few instances. But if you like these kinds of games, do yourself a favor and check out Beyond the Labyrinth. Man, I love this thing. Going back to it after all these years reminds me of my early days in college. 
It got me through a lot of long nights with so many great games, and it's been nice to go back and play some titles that I hadn't experienced before. Hell, I could have even mentioned more stuff like Geist Crusher from Capcom, Digimon Redigitized Decode, or even a sequel to Magician's Quest Mysterious Times on the DS. Either way, I hope this video encourages you to go grab that 3DS again and show it some love. It deserves it. Oh crap. I got a street pass.